Chapters one to five of the story of my misfortunes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. The Story of My Misfortunes by Peter Abelard. Translated by Henry Adams Bellows. Forward. Often the hearts of men and women are stirred, as likewise they are soothed in their sorrows, more by example than by words. And therefore, because I too have known some consolation from speech had with one who was a witness thereof, am I now minded to write of the sufferings which have sprung out of my misfortunes, for the eyes of one who, though absent, is of himself ever a consoler. This I do so that, in comparing your sorrows with mine, you may discover that yours are in truth naught, or at the most but of small account, and so you shall come to bear them more easily. CHAPTER One. Know, then, that I am come from a certain town which was built on the way into Lesser Brittany, distant some eight miles, as I think, eastward from the city of Nantes, and in its own tongue called Palais. Such is the nature of that country, or it may be of them who dwell there, for in truth they are quick in fancy that my mind bent itself easily to the study of letters yet more i had a father who had won some smattering of letters before he had girded on the soldier's belt and so it came about that long afterwards his love thereof was so strong that he saw to it that each son of his should be taught in letters even earlier than in the management of arms Thus indeed did it come to pass, and because I was his first-born, and for that reason the more dear to him, he sought with double diligence to have me wisely taught. For my part, the more I went forward in the study of letters, and ever more easily, the greater became the ardour of my devotion to them until in truth i was so enthralled by my passion for learning that gladly leaving to my brothers the pomp of glory in arms the right of heritage and all the honours that should have been mine as the eldest born i fled utterly from the court of mars that i might win learning in the bosom of minerva and since I found the armoury of logical reasoning more to my liking than the other forms of philosophy, I exchanged all other weapons for these, and to the prizes of victory in war I preferred the battle of minds in disputation. Thenceforth, journeying through many provinces, and debating as I went, going whithersoever I heard that the study of my chosen art most flourished, I became such an one as the Peripatetics. CHAPTER Two. I came at length to Paris, where above all in those days the art of dialectics was most flourishing, and there did I meet William of Champeaux, my teacher a man most distinguished in his science both by his renown and by his true merit with him i remained for some time at first indeed well liked of him but later i brought him great grief because i undertook to refute certain of his opinions not infrequently attacking him in disputation and now and then in these debates I was a judged victor. Now this, to those among my fellow-students who were ranked foremost, seemed all the more insufferable because of my youth and the brief duration of my studies. Out of this sprang the beginning of my misfortunes, 
which have followed me even to the present day the more widely my fame was spread abroad the more bitter was the envy that was kindled against me it was given out that i presuming on my gifts far beyond the warranty of my youth was aspiring despite my tender years to the leadership of a school nay more that i was making ready the very place in which i would undertake this task the place being none other than the castle of melun at that time a royal seat my teacher himself had some foreknowledge of this and tried to remove my school as far as possible from his own working in secret he sought in every way he could before i left his following to bring to naught the school i had planned and the place i had chosen for it since however in that very place he had many rivals and some of the men of influence among the great ones of the land relying on their aid i won to the fulfilment of my wish the support of many was secured for me by reason of his own unconcealed envy from this small inception of my school my fame in the art of dialectics began to spread abroad so that little by little the renown not alone of those who had been my fellow students but of our very teacher himself grew dim and was like to die out altogether thus it came about that still more confident in myself i moved my school as soon as i well might to the castle of corbeil which is hard by the city of paris for there i knew there would be given more frequent chance for my assaults in our battle of disputation no long time thereafter i was smitten with a grievous illness brought upon me by my immoderate zeal for study this illness forced me to turn homeward to my native province and thus for some years i was as if cut off from france and yet for that very reason i was sought out all the more eagerly by those whose hearts were troubled by the law of dialectics but after a few years had passed and i was whole again from my sickness i learned that my teacher that same william archdeacon of paris had changed his former garb and joined an order of the regular clergy this he had done or so men said in order that he might be deemed more deeply religious and so might be elevated to a loftier rank in the prelacy a thing which in truth very soon came to pass for he was made bishop of chalon nevertheless the garb he had donned by reason of his conversion did naught to keep him away either from the city of paris or from his wonted study of philosophy and in the very monastery wherein he had shut himself up for the sake of religion he straightway set to teaching again after the same fashion as before to him did i return for i was eager to learn more of rhetoric from his lips and in the course of our many arguments on various matters i compelled him by most potent reasoning first to alter his former opinion on the subject of the universals and finally to abandon it altogether now the basis of this old concept of his regarding the reality of universal ideas was that the same quality formed the essence alike of the abstract whole and of the individuals which were its parts in other words that there could be no essential differences among these individuals all being alike save for such variety as might grow out of the many accidents of existence thereafter however he corrected this opinion no longer maintaining that the same quality was the essence of all things but that rather it manifested itself in them through diverse ways this problem of universals is ever the most vexed one among logicians 
to such a degree indeed that even porphyry writing in his isagoge regarding universals dared not attempt a final pronouncement thereon saying rather this is the deepest of all problems of its kind wherefore it followed that when william had first revised and then finally abandoned altogether his views on this one subject his lecturing sank into such a state of negligent reasoning that it could scarce be called lecturing on the science of dialectics at all it was as if all his science had been bound up in this one question of the nature of universals thus it came about that my teaching won such strength and authority that even those who before had clung most vehemently to my former master and most bitterly attacked my doctrines now flocked to my school the very man who had succeeded to my master's chair in the paris school offered me his post in order that he might put himself under my tutelage along with all the rest and this in the very place where of old his master and mine had reigned and when in so short a time my master saw me directing the study of dialectics there it is not easy to find words to tell with what envy he was consumed or with what pain he was tormented he could not long in truth bear the anguish of what he felt to be his wrongs and shrewdly he attacked me that he might drive me forth and because there was naught in my conduct whereby he could come at me openly he tried to steal away the school by launching the vilest calumnies against him who had yielded his post to me and by putting in his place a certain rival of mine so then i returned to melun and set up my school there as before and the more openly his envy pursued me the greater was the authority it conferred upon me even so held the poet jealousy aims at the peaks the winds storm the loftiest summits ovid remedy for love book one line three six nine not long thereafter when william became aware of the fact that almost all his students were holding grave doubts as to his religion and were whispering earnestly among themselves about his conversion deeming that he had by no means abandoned this world he withdrew himself and his brotherhood together with his students to a certain estate far distant from the city forthwith i returned from melun to paris hoping for peace from him in the future but since as i have said he had caused my place to be occupied by a rival of mine i pitched the camp as it were of my school outside the city on mont saint genevieve thus i was as one laying siege to him who had taken possession of my post no sooner had my master heard of this than he brazenly returned post haste to the city bringing back with him such students as he could, and reinstating his brotherhood in their former monastery, much as if he would free his soldiery whom he had deserted from my blockade. In truth, though, if it was his purpose to bring them succour, he did naught but hurt them. Before that time my rival had indeed had a certain number of students of one sort and another, chiefly by reason of his lectures on Priscian, in which he was considered of great authority. After our master had returned, however, he lost nearly all of these followers, and thus was compelled to give up the direction of the school not long thereafter apparently despairing further of worldly fame he was converted to the monastic life following the return of our master to the city 
the combats in disputation which my scholars waged both with him himself and with his pupils and the successes which fortune gave to us and above all to me in these wars you have long since learned of through your own experience the boast of ajax though i speak it more temperately i still am bold enough to make if fain you would learn now how victory crowned the battle by him was i never vanquished ovid metamorphoses book thirteen line eighty nine but even were i to be silent the fact proclaims itself and its outcome reveals the truth regarding it while these things were happening it became needful for me again to repair to my old home by reason of my dear mother lucia for after the conversion of my father berengarius to the monastic life she so ordered her affairs as to do likewise when all this had been completed i returned to france above all in order that i might study theology since now my oft-mentioned teacher william was active in the episcopate of chalon in this held of learning anselm of laon who was his teacher therein had for long years enjoyed the greatest renown chapter three sought out therefore this same venerable man whose fame in truth was more the result of long-established custom than of the potency of his own talent or intellect if any one came to him impelled by doubt on any subject he went away more doubtful still he was wonderful indeed in the eyes of those who only listened to him but those who asked him questions perforce held him as naught he had a miraculous flock of words but they were contemptible in meaning and quite void of reason when he kindled a fire he filled his house with smoke and illumined it not at all he was a tree which seemed noble to those who gazed upon its leaves from afar but to those who came nearer and examined it more closely was revealed its barrenness when therefore i had come to this tree that i might pluck the fruit thereof i discovered that it was indeed the fig tree which our lord cursed matthew chapter twenty one verse nineteen mark eleven thirteen or that ancient oak to which lucan likened pompey saying he stands the shade of a name once mighty like to the towering oak in the midst of the fruitful field lucan pharsalia book four line one three five it was not long before i made this discovery and stretched myself lazily in the shade of that same tree i went to his lectures less and less often a thing which some among his eminent followers took sorely to heart because they interpreted it as a mark of contempt for so illustrious a teacher thenceforth they secretly sought to influence him against me and by their vile insinuations made me hated of him it chanced moreover that one day after the exposition of certain texts we scholars were jesting among ourselves and one of them seeking to draw me out asked me what i thought of the lectures on the books of scripture i who had as yet studied only the sciences replied that following such lectures seemed to me most useful in so far as the salvation of the soul was concerned but that it appeared quite extraordinary to me that educated persons should not be able to understand the sacred books simply by studying them themselves together with the glosses thereon and without the aid of any teacher most of those who were present mocked at me and asked whether i myself could do as i had said 
or whether I would dare to undertake it. I answered that if they wished, I was ready to try it. Forthwith they cried out and jeered all the more. Well and good, said they, we agree to the test. Pick out and give us an exposition of some doubtful passage in the scriptures, so that we can put this boast of yours to the proof. And they all chose that most obscure prophecy of Ezekiel. I accepted the challenge, and invited them to attend a lecture on the very next day, whereupon they undertook to give me good advice, saying that I should by no means make undue haste in so important a matter, but that I ought to devote a much longer space to working out my exposition and offsetting my inexperience by diligent toil. To this I replied indignantly that it was my wont to win success not by routine, but by ability. I added that I would abandon the test altogether unless they would agree not to put off their attendance at my lecture. In truth, at this first lecture of mine, only a few were present, for it seemed quite absurd to all of them that I, hitherto so inexperienced in discussing the scriptures, should attempt the thing so hastily. However, this lecture gave such satisfaction to all those who heard it, that they spread its praises abroad with notable enthusiasm and thus compelled me to continue my interpretation of the sacred text. When word of this was bruited about, those who had stayed away from the first lecture came eagerly, some to the second and more to the third, and all of them were eager to write down the glosses which I had begun on the first day, so as to have them from the very beginning. CHAPTER Four. Now this venerable man of whom I have spoken was acutely smitten with envy, and straightway incited, as I have already mentioned, by the insinuations of sundry persons, began to persecute me for my lecturing on the scriptures, no less bitterly than my former master William had done for my work in philosophy. At that time there were in this old man's school two who were considered far to excel all the others, Alberic of Reims and Lotulf the Lombard. The better opinion these two held of themselves, the more they were incensed against me, chiefly at their suggestion, as it afterwards transpired, yonder venerable coward had the impudence to forbid me to carry on any further in his school the work of preparing glosses which I had thus begun. The pretext, he alleged, was that if by chance in the course of this work I should write anything containing blunders, as was likely enough in view of my lack of training, the thing might be imputed to him. When this came to the ears of his scholars, they were filled with indignation at so undisguised a manifestation of spite, the like of which had never been directed against any one before. The more obvious this rancour became, the more it redounded to my honour, and his persecution did naught save to make me more famous. CHAPTER Five. And so, after a few days, I returned to Paris, and there for several years I peacefully directed the school which formerly had been destined for me, nay, even offered to me, but from which I had been driven out. At the very outset of my work there, I set about completing the glosses on Ezekiel which I had begun at Laon. These proved so satisfactory to all who read them, that they came to believe me no less adept in lecturing on theology than I had proved myself to be in the held of philosophy. 
thus my school was notably increased in size by reason of my lectures on subjects of both these kinds and the amount of financial profit as well as glory which it brought me cannot be concealed from you for the matter was widely talked of but prosperity always puffs up the foolish and worldly comfort enervates the soul rendering it an easy prey to carnal temptations thus i who by this time had come to regard myself as the only philosopher remaining in the whole world and had ceased to fear any further disturbance of my peace began to loosen the rein on my desires although hitherto i had always lived in the utmost continence and the greater progress i made in my lecturing on philosophy or theology the more i departed alike from the practice of the philosophers and the spirit of the divines in the uncleanness of my life for it is well known methinks that philosophers and still more those who have devoted their lives to arousing the love of sacred study have been strong above all else in the beauty of chastity thus did it come to pass that while i was utterly absorbed in pride and sensuality divine grace the cure for both diseases was forced upon me even though i forsooth would fain have shunned it first i was punished for my sensuality and then for my pride for my sensuality i lost those things whereby i practised it for my pride engendered in me by my knowledge of letters and it is even as the apostle said knowledge puffeth itself up one corinthians chapter eight verse one i knew the humiliation of seeing burned the very book in which i most gloried and now it is my desire that you should know the stories of these two happenings understanding them more truly from learning the very facts than from hearing what is spoken of them and in the order in which they came about because i had ever held in abhorrence the foulness of prostitutes because i had diligently kept myself from all excesses and from association with the women of noble birth who attended the school because i knew so little of the common talk of ordinary people perverse and subtly flattering chance gave birth to an occasion for casting me lightly down from the heights of my own exaltation nay in such case not even divine goodness could redeem one who having been so proud was brought to such shame were it not for the blessed gift of grace end of chapter five Recording by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey